We are broadcasting, people. <laughs> coast to coast. Of course, last year I said this, yesterday I said the same thing and it didn't work. Like I said, everyone's off to get me. These are the times I try to make all. And it's our duty as citizens to do what? In the social contract. Oh, who's an uh, English philosopher did the social contract? Locke. John Locke. And governments are there to do what? What is the only real purpose of government according to the document? To start the United States. Yeah. Secure rights and when can the people change it? And what is the duty then of everybody? We must do what? Be informed, be vigilant, pay attention, watch. Gosh darn it. <laughs> declaration of finish the Declaration of Independence, and that is going to be a key part of the test. But like when we usually take notes in our notebook, what does he write down as the end of law? Declaration of Independence. We didn't quite fit or we 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 did the philosophy mostly. Didn't I finish with we created the United States, we did that, right? Yeah. But, we, but it wasn't clear about what. I think right with the bell ring. Yeah. Yeah, Ex exactly right. Are we one United States or 13 independent states? What is the word for power? Sovereign. Who is sovereign? The states or the country? Technically, the people. So we have the people. But the people get power to the states first or the national or the whole country first? What war will we fight about this? And who would win? The United States. The United States won the Civil War. If we were numbering these, what number would we be on? Purple. <laughs> I'm sorry, what number? Well, I have, I like, I had what we had on Friday, but now what we have on Monday, and I don't know where we. Okay, so the rest of the grievances. Okay, which grievances? Grievances was a fourth part. I'm oh, sorry, third part of the Constitution, correct? I think you said fourth yesterday. We have the preamble. The philosophy, the philosophy has equality, social contract, mm -hmm. oh, and, a, and that little rights thing. Right. What is the right to independence? Uh, it is, the right to life. life. What does it go as far as your abilities and potentials take you? What is that? Pursuit of happiness. And liberty is freedom of what? Con science. <laughs> Conscience. Does this be, okay, I'm sorry, you're gone. That's the fact you're gone. Get, get notes from somebody, borrow someone's notes you trust, and look it around you know, carefully. And, but no, Chris, borrow someone's notes you trust, and then look through it, and like on Wednesday or Thursday, ask them, okay? Come up and ask them. All right. So, the Declaration of Independence is ratified. We are now a country, correct? Yeah. The largest amphibious operation that Britain had ever done is organizing themselves at Halifax and just about ready to sail, just as John Hancock wrote the Constitution, or the, Constitution ah, the Declaration of Independence, and it's being spread through the colonies. Yeah. The, the number three, that was part of the philosophy. Okay. Grievances for the third part, and then the announcement, basically creating the United States as a whole. So, up here in Halifax, a massive operation. Now, think about it. They just wrote the Declaration of Independence. They declared independence on the second. They're going home. That handbill is going all over the colonies, and the British are sailing down. <coughs> and they arrive off what city? They get lost. And then eventually land at New York. And thus, less than a month, hundreds of ships arrive off New York. A huge operation. If you hear this from amphibious, amphibious means, amphibious means that it's a seaboard invasion of the land. I've been looking for this phone all day. Thank you. And you know I lose these things. <laughs> wow. This is amazing. And you turn it upside down, you can read the words on top. That's incredible. You ever skipped a walk? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So, they arrived off New York just less than a month. <coughs> less than a month after the Declaration of Independence. Washington knows they're going there. The problem is Washington has virtually no army. There's a couple thousand of the militia near Boston that kind of had some training. They don't have uniforms. They have whatever clothes they happen to have. A few of the officers have militia uniforms and they're kind of blue. So if you ever see the Continental Army, the Revolutionary War Army, they weren't blue. Just a few men have blue. But that is why the French Army, after the Revolution, would be blue, copying the United States. Well, and then now everybody copies the French. At least that time they copied the United States. They arrived off New York. And the thing about New York was, it's right in the middle. New York pretty much cuts the colonies in half. They didn't want to mess with Boston again because they're crazy. So they'll go there. And and I drew up a map for you, put on an overhead, because I care about you as people. Look at that. That's pretty darn good. Now see the problem? <laughs> yeah, hard to read. That's why they got one. But then, turning the overhead around, they land off New York Harbor. Now this is the way New York was at this time. Now if you go there today, this is what we call people. And they're everywhere. There's like 20 or 30 people live here. <laughs> <laughs> Manhattan Island. New York was basically on a tip about 10,000 people. Washington had an army of around 10,000. Here's Long Island, which is now Brooklyn, Queens. Well, then it was a pretty rugged area here, kind of farmland here. It's a long island. And the Hudson River, this straight here is called the East River. Today, even though it's not a river. And here's New York. Staten Island it was just a rocky island. Now it's a part of New York, people. Well, the British arrived here, and in July, they occupied Staten Island and just began to build up supplies. Washington foolishly went to Long Island. What's called Brooklyn Heights, where Brooklyn is today. Today, it's all people. There's a little plaque there, and that's all. And he lined up his men in kind of quasi breastworks, fortifications, right there. And Washington showed he had no idea what he was doing yet. First off, he never should have gotten an island. Because if you're caught on an island and you're defeated, how do you get your army off? It's an island, and they have a really big navy. You don't put your men on an island. The other thing he did is, he had fought small little, almost like we would call today, guerrilla actions in the French and Indian War. He had never fought with a large army, where you have to organize your lines, and the biggie, protect your flanks. He did not protect his flank. He would do that time after time. It's called hanging flank. So he had his men facing this way, but no one guarding their left side. And it was really rugged. There's like little passes through these hills. It's all gone now. It's all paved over. What did he need just a couple hundred men to do that? But instead, instead, he leaves it open. And so when the British do attack at the end of August, they do attack where they attack his main lines, and then send 10,000 men around his flank. And they totally took Washington's army by surprise. In fact, the only thing that saved Washington's army, <coughs> the only thing, anyone want to guess? Well, what did the militia do? They ran. Yeah, they ran as fast as they could and then hit water. The only thing that saved them, it got dark. They attacked too late in the day. If they would have attacked just an hour and a half earlier, the entire <laughs> war would have ended. Washington's army would have been destroyed, and it's impossible to imagine the United States, at least the way we know it, win. And we'd have an entirely different course of history. Literally, an hour and a half. That's all it would have taken. So Washington basically went in this, kind of isolated himself right here, but he had this big waterway. And the Royal Navy has almost 300 ships, almost 100 of them are combat ships. But there was a stormy night on the night of August 29th and 30th. And this place here we loosely call Kipps Bay. Kipps Bay. It was a rough, stormy night. It's a very narrow channel with a lot of rocks. So the British decided, well, the commanding general is a general by the name of William Howe. 
His brother was the admiral. They kept it in the family. Admiral Howe didn't put any ships in Kips Bay. Just one or two medium-sized ships called frigates, Washington could not have escaped. His army would have been destroyed because Howe was going to attack on the morning of the 30th, and the revolution would have ended, and the Declaration of Independence would have been a, fit, a footnote in British history. And we're talking like one of these key moments in history. Even more than that, just a couple ships. But instead, no. And they braved the rough seas. Washington's men, who were actually fishermen from Rhode Island, they're the ones who rode in whale boats and took his 9,000 men across and saved Washington's army. Kipps Bay was one of those just moments like, wow, just a minor little thing would have changed everything we know. You'd be speaking Bulgarian. I'd be standing over there. You'd be sitting over here. It would be chaos. <laughs> you go to a stoplight, red would mean go. It would be nuts. <laughs> well, Washington got across and then fled across Manhattan. He made, he made mistake after mistake. He should have burned the, the piers in New York so the British couldn't use it. He forgot. He left a bunch of men and cannon in this fort up here. It was taken and lost half his gunpowder. They would fight two more inconclusive battles at, Har at Harlem Heights and a place called White Oaks. White Plains, I'm sorry. The point is, a disaster. An absolute disaster. Washington would end up losing in the war almost every battle he would fight. But you think about it, he's outnumbered against a better trained, better equipped army. You would expect him to lose. But here's the thing. He won it, he almost lost every battle and won the war. So, yeah, be great to be a great tactician, but what matters is, in the end, you're on top. So, he fled eventually into New Jersey and ran away across New Jersey. It's going into winter, and because of the rain, the British don't want to campaign in the winter. The rain, it's snow, powder gets wet, you're pretty much worthless. So, what they do is, the British go into winter camp in New York, and Washington survives. One thing we got to get, after the disasters in New York, going in September, his army has bled away. They've all run away. But, not all, but a significant number. Back in Philadelphia, the Continental Congress is going nuts. Absolutely freaking out. In fact, it's because of the New York battles why they ended up all signing the Declaration of Independence. Basically, they pass it around saying, you better still mean it now when times are bad. And that's why they all signed it, besides just John Hancock. John Adams, in Philadelphia, remember, he's the one who wanted Washington. He would turn immediately and say, we got to fire Washington. Washington's incompetent. we got to replace him with anybody. We need a new general. He had completely lost it, Adams. <laughs> and so, he wanted a general by the name of Charles Lee. And Lee was a former British officer who came to the United States. He basically came in and said, I'm the professional. Let me take over. And it was a razor-thin margin. Or Washington had a razor-thin margin. If he did not win, Lee would become the new general. And we are really lucky. Because as it turned out, Lee was completely incompetent. And would end up just going back to Britain. And probably would not have won the war. So I will take you to New Jersey. Who's been to New Jersey? Ooh, do you brag about it? <coughs> New Jersey's great. The northern part of New Jersey today is like a toxic waste dump. The southern part, cows. <laughs> it's the Garden State. It's a really interesting place, and I'll tell you why it's a toxic waste dump a little bit later. It's not quite a toxic waste dump. It's a toxic waste dump with houses. Okay, so here's New York. Here is Philadelphia, in between New Jersey. Right here, the Delaware River, which is a straight river. You ought to see it just straight as an arrow. At least my interpretation of it. There is a postal road, which is nothing more than a couple wagon rod trails that go, <laughs> there's no bridges anywhere in the, in the colonies or now the United States. So it goes pretty much across New Jersey 
north of Philadelphia, there's a ford here to get across to Delaware, and then it goes into Philadelphia. And there's a couple little towns, but no one used roads. I mean, it, it's almost impossible unless the weather was really bad. Washington fled down that road, and every night, men deserted. He had over 9,500 men at the Battle of Long Island. By the time he got to the Delaware River in at the end of October, he had less than 2,000. And every night, men were sick and dying as he crossed and camped here. Not by Valley Forge. Valley Forge is another year and a half away. They had a lot of miserable winters. Yeah. Well, here is a little town called Trenton, right across the river from Washington's camp. And basically what the British did is they just kind of garrisoned along there, and their plan was wait till it got warmer, which was a stupid mistake. If the British would have aggressively chased Washington, they might have won the war right there. Again, at another opportunity. But the British are saying, you know, like, it's over. I'm going to... General Howe's like, let me just stay in New York in a nice house and be comfortable. So they put unlucky troops, which to them was like in the middle of the wilderness, New Jersey. Here, they put mercenaries. Now, these mercenaries were from the German principality called Hesa. So in American history, they've become known as the Hessians. And they wore green uniforms, thus the green pen. Now, what's a mercenary? They work. Right. They fight for money, but all soldiers fight for money. What is the important thing is what is their only reason for fighting? They don't fight. Yeah, it's not for country, it's for money. Or plunder. Actually, these poor guys didn't even get the money. They were drafted into the Hasten Army conscription, they called it. And then their king sold them to Britain. The king got the money. Not them. Those poor guys. And they stuck them out here and they're Miserable. Miserable. As they see it, it's a howling, <coughs> dangerous wilderness. And think about the colonists. Nobody likes an occupying army. But if the occupying army speaks a different language, oh, even loyalists hated the Hessians. And then the Hessians in return hated and didn't trust them. So the morale was horrible. In fact, that's why they stuck them out here. We'll put you guys out here. So Washington, his army's bleeding away. But he knows there's Hessians across the river. He needs something to hold his army together. He needs some kind of success, or it will just bleed away. Well, he hears from Patriot spies. By the way, what does a Patriot look like? And what does a Loyalist look like? How do you tell the difference? There's going to be spies for both sides. Patriot spies, Loyalist spies. I mean. They wear hoods and walk around in the shadows. Yes, exactly. <laughs> then he opened the hood and says, I'm from Britain. Ah, oh, gotcha. No, their hoods are different colors. Red for Britain, blue for America. <laughs> Those are good spies. <laughs> oh, where are the patriotic army? Where's the patriotic army? Okay, so <laughs> they're here. They find out that the Hessians are going to get a their Christmas celebration. Not the traditional seven-day celebration, but just a one-day celebration. Now, Christmas was a seven-day drunk. Christmas is, was not a religious holiday at all. Yeah, they do a little bit of a service at church, but it really didn't mean anything. What's the holiday that is important to Christians? Easter. Easter is the one that matters. Christmas, I mean, they just kind of made up a date. And we know they made it up because they took the Roman holiday, holiday of Saturnella and called it Christmas. Because that didn't matter. It's the resurrection that matters to Christians. So that was basically, we made it through winter and the days are going to get longer. Let's celebrate. That's what it was. Some parts would be a 12-day drunk. The holiday, and it's more it's more secular, which is not religious than sectarian today, at least the way it started, in reality, would come in the 1840s, 1850s, especially 1860s, because of the Industrial Revolution sell stuff. Then it was being drunk. That is why the Puritans banned Christmas. No Christmas because of that. That's not how the chosen ones are supposed to have. So, they're going to get one day, Christmas Day. They're going to have their celebration. Remember I told you the first, I think I told you guys this, the first permanent police force in the American 
from the United States is creating in New York to stop Christmas. <laughs> How did New York New Yorkers sell Christmas? Huh? How did New Yorkers sell Christmas? <laughs> Very good, I like that. Well, and this is pre you know, well, I guess there was a <laughs> history of Christmas is pretty interesting. So, well, they're gonna have the celebration on Christmas Day. Patriot spies tell Washington, and Washington decides this is the time. If I do a daring attack across the river, I can take my supplies. When do you attack the Hessians? At Christmas. No. Not when they're drunk. Which when they're sleeping it off. Attack the morning of the 26th. Attack right before sunup. So they are all asleep. And that's when you attack. And so that's when Washington attacked. The Battle of Trenton. Pretty clever idea, isn't it? This is all or nothing. If this army's caught across the Delaware, I mean, it's now less than a thousand men. Half of them don't even have shoes. You can follow their march by the bloody footprints <laughs> in the snow and the mud. Especially think about the mud. If we're floating between 30 and 35 degrees, think about frozen mud, what that would do to your feet. Just rip them apart. They were of a different breed, clearly. So the men are like, he had to convince them, okay, we got to go fight. We might all die, but maybe we can steal their boots. That could be part of it. But Thomas Paine would write maybe his greatest pamphlet. It was called The American Crisis. The American Crisis was written after the Declaration of Independence and after the disasters of New York. And it's basically saying, don't quit. We can fight. We can win. It's worth it. Because it looks like it's falling apart. Washington read it to his soldiers. And for the most part, they sat there shivering and teeth chattering. They're like, all right, get done. But the first lines are some of the greatest ever written. So I'm going to read to you just the beginning of it. You might have heard some of these lines before. It's brilliant. <coughs> I, I admire pain, by the way. It's time to get the Trump picture off. I didn't realize Trump was on there. He's on. I know. It's Trump. That's Thomas Paine. Thomas Paine was an Englishman who came to the colonies because he wanted, believed in this idea of rights, of liberal, of this uh, kind of a liberal government. Then he wrote to the French Revolution and barely saved his head. He barely made it out. Yes. <laughs> These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of his country. But he that stands it now, it's all capitalized, so it's like yellow, deserves the love and thanks of men and women. Tyranny like hell is not easily conquered. Yet we have this consolation with us, that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. These are the times that try men souls. What a great beginning. When he talks about summer soldiers and sunshine patriots, who are they? Who are the summer soldiers? Yeah, people who, hey, when times are good, they're there. They ran away when, back, when we started losing. Who are the sunshine patriots? Hmm? Yeah, bad times, they're still there. They're loyal. And that would be a great saying because he's telling the men who are standing there, shivering, looking at them, you guys are what? Yeah. You're going to win this war. You're the best. We can do it with you. Now, Payne's trying to rally the soldiers, rally the patriots. Washington is just trying to get them to be willing to cross the river. One step at a time. I don't think saying that would be enough to take a musket ball in the face, but it might be enough to get you to walk a few miles. Why would somebody be willing to take a musket ball in the face? I'm serious. No, I'm serious. That could happen to you. And you might not die right away. Any volunteers? I'm about to, um, if everything goes right, we got the PSAT test, I'll tell you more about manual more. So I'm going to time it there when I got kind of the weird days. 
which would be good day for that. Why do they do it? You want to know why? To this day, why soldiers are willing to do it? Cause doesn't work. Money doesn't even work. They're friends. They don't want to their friends. That is the reason they do it. So, that's why you, well, that's why the replacements we talk about in Vietnam are so bad. Yeah. Well, because we're doing Vietnam War and special times. Well, they cross the river. <coughs> that painting right there, I know it's kind of hard to see. It's from a German artist. If you can't see it, you can go stand up and look. It's, it's one of the more famous pictures of the <coughs> Revolutionary War. It's done by a German artist who's trying to promote German nationalism, which I think is kind of funny. So he shows <laughs> Washington crossing the Delaware. And they show Washington standing on the bow of the ship. No, he didn't do that. He's not a nut. But And the river wasn't quite icy, but it's a miserable ride. It's risky. The same guys who, who got, rode him across Kipps Bay, rode him across here. And most of them did not have uniform. They kind of do a pretty good job of showing that. When they landed, loyalist farmers saw them and tried to run in the train and then warned the Hessians and couldn't wake anybody up. And so when the British, or sorry, when the Continental Army attacked just before sunup, it took the Hessians totally by surprise, which is fortunate because over half of the U.S. soldiers, or Continental soldiers, their powder got wet. It's worthless. They couldn't have fired. Fortunately, the Hessians could organize a line. A few of them kind of came pouring out of the, you know, their homes, they're trying to, or their uh, whatever barns, wherever they were sleeping trying to put their uniforms on, and it was a rout over very quickly. And the Hessians were defeated. They paroled most of the Hessians, you know, let them walk back to New York, they took their boots. And not a huge victory, but they can win a fight now. Well, when the British found out a couple days later, they sent 10,000 men down to finally finish them off. And they went racing down this road, and Washington <laughs> did a very smart thing. What did Washington do? He's sitting in Trent. He did what? 10,000 troops are coming at him. He has less than 1,000. What did he do? Run away. <laughs> he actually crossed the river, came back, and eventually encamped south of the river. The British, under a general by the name of Cornwallis, which is just a great name, came running down the road, and when they got to Trenton, right about the first the new year, they were the Americans. And they decided to attack on the third. And that's what Washington does. Another thing, a trick he learned in the French and Indian War. He had his men like campfires at night. And then do what? March away. That morning of the 3rd, the British attacked an empty campground. And then Washington turned and attacked the British rear guard at Princeton. January 1st, 1777. That's why Trenton and Princeton go together. Now, there weren't that many British soldiers in this rear guard. And, but the Continental Army was exhausted. Their lines broke down, and they almost lost. But Washington mounted his, mounted his horse, grabbed his hat, and rode to the front, screaming at his men to rally. Bullets are whizzing by him. One went through his hat. Just barely missed him. So it kind of gave the aura, like, I'm invincible screaming at his men to rally. And they, you know, think about a big man on the big horse, everybody shooting at him, these British. And so his men rallied, turned, and charged, and the British broke. Princeton was a victory. Washington showed he's a leader. The men followed him, the <laughs> men trusted him. The most important thing for an officer, not the men trust him. He wasn't a great commander as a tactician, but he was a leader. And as the British ran away, he's chasing him, waving his hat, saying, Men, it's a fox hunt. Let's get him. And they all cheered. And then Washington did another very smart thing. What? Run away. So when Cornwallis turned back, Washington went up and spent a miserable winter <laughs> at a place called Morristown. Morristown and Valley Forge are going to be synonymous with misery. Their camps would be infected with smallpox. Much of their army would bleed away. They didn't have enough food. But they survived. And that is when Washington would begin to realize how he could win. And this is really important 
It's a lesson that countries should learn. People should learn. And they never seem to learn. Think about what the British have. So just think about it. What advantages do the British have in this war? Yeah, every advantage you could give you one. They have this navy, so they can attack up and down the coast. They can attack, pull them out, attack another place, supply everywhere. The strongest navy in the world. What else do they have? Yeah. Yeah, they have, not only did they have a system of taxes, but you could borrow money. Think about the new United States. Would any of you loan money to the United States in 1776, especially after New York fell? Because what happens if the United States falls? What happens to that debt? What happens? Are they? You never get your money. So they couldn't borrow money at all. The U.S. had no money. I wouldn't loan them money. What's another advantage? Yeah. <coughs> hmm? Discipline. Yeah, a disciplined, trained army. And also to add to that, officers who were trained knew their stuff. Now, <coughs> luckily, the United States would turn out to have a couple very good. In fact, one of the best, the fighting Quaker, Nathaniel Green. Which is ironic, because Quakers believe in what? Peace. Yeah, they're pacifists, but Green would try to be one of the greats, the fighting Quaker. What's another advantage to that? Yeah. More men. Yeah, significantly more men. And a better way to get them into the fight. We also have one. You might have say, you might have another one? Better yeah. Be better commander than what? Yeah, and they can afford to buy mercenaries. Yeah. We say the Navy once before, but yeah. But that's, I can't even begin to tell you what a big deal the Navy is. They have a government. <laughs> they have a government. We got a bunch of guys in Philadelphia who are all running away after New York. What's the United States have for advantage? Now, this home field is a big deal. You renew the terrain, we're fighting for our homes. That's a big advantage. Washington would be a great leader. We had a pretty good cause, right? But is a cause enough? No. But the biggest advantage we have, one that is decisive, was this. Washington would begin to live, realize it. As long, and he learned it here at Morristown, all Washington has to do is survive. <coughs> survive. Stay in the fight. Show he's fighting. That's why Trent and Princeton were so important. Stay in the fight. Show he's fighting. And eventually, Britain will do what? Give up. They will give up. Because they always give up. Eventually, the cost isn't worth it. As long as Washington's army survives. That's what? Long Island. Or for that matter, here, or the risky to their trip. If its army was destroyed, that's the number one army. There's no way the United States can survive. Britain will go home. So, why Trenton and Princeton were so important? Trenton and Princeton were so important because it convinced patriots we can fight and survive. That's why Trenton and Princeton would be decisive for the history of the United States. Everyone got that? It convinced patriots we can fight this war. Yeah, we can't defeat their army, their main army, but we can fight. They got to come after us. And so the British can attack anywhere. They can go anywhere as long as we retreat and stay in the fight. If the Confederacy would have realized that soon earlier in the Civil War, they very well could have won that war. In fact, arguably should have. But the United States, fortunately, won that war. I like the United States. If I said that in Texas, you'd probably run me out. But we won. The US is going to find this out in a couple places, aren't we? In my lifetime, this has happened many times, where the United States trot figure we can impose what we want. They resisted, survived, and we left, and they won. Where? We're doing it right now. Korea? Yeah. Korea, not so much. Korea's a little bit different. That was more set piece, yeah. Vietnam. Vietnam. I'm sorry. Jay? I'm sorry. Minus 600. Ooh, 666. <laughs> <laughs> Which, by the way, is the mark of who? Neural. <laughs> it is. It's true. It's never a neural. That, it was code. It was code in the New Testament for neural. Mm -hmm. Vietnam? You said Vietnam, didn't you? Yeah. Vietnam! 
We want the United States and our allies won most of the battles. Yeah, we didn't keep to Vietnam. South Vietnam did not survive. We lost because we went home. It happened elsewhere. It happened in the Philippines, in the United States. It's, it happened in Iraq. And it will certainly happen. 